Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast, with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hey there, Baha'i Blogcast. It's me, Rain Wilson. I'm in Portland, Oregon today and sitting down with someone who I'm really excited to have a conversation with. This is Stephen Phelps, PhD, Dr. Stephen Phelps, ginger, philosopher, translator, physicist, Baha'i. Fascinating story, and I'm really excited to have a conversation with you. How's it going, Stephen? It's going great. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. And you brought some tea with you to share with me in these special little teacups. Can you tell us about the tea that you're drinking here? Uh, this is Iron Goddess of Mercy tea. I drink it for good luck. It is a special version of oolong tea, uh, every leaf of which has been lovingly picked by specially trained monkeys who ascend to the tops of the tea bushes only like on certain movie. weeks of the year, on a certain special mountain, they bring the tea leaves down in special reed baskets, uh, and they bring them for processing, where they're carefully roasted over a course of, of, of many weeks. Uh, do you think that it reaches, we, could, uh, yes. we could train these monkeys to do some yard work for me? <laughs> let's, let's listen to the sound effect. Here's the oolong tea. I hope the mic picked that up. What is it called? <laughs> Special Goddess of Mercy? What? Iron Goddess of Mercy. Iron Goddess of Mercy. Wow. Okay. Um, <sighs> Stephen, there's so much I, I want to talk to you about, and we have a short amount of time before we get kicked out of this room. But first and foremost, how did you come to the Baha'i faith? Did you grow up in a Baha'i family? I did. My parents uh, are Baha'is. We grew up in a very small town. I was born in Walla Walla, Washington. We were the only Baha'is in, in our little town uh, north of Walla Walla. Uh, Walla Walla is small enough. I grew up in Connell. Sometimes Connell, my, is that on planet Krypton? Yeah, it might as well be. But actually, Walla Walla is an interesting town because um, there were a lot of old Baha'is there, some of whom knew Abdul Baha. It what? wasn't until much later that I realized that there are a large number of, of letters that Abdul Baha wrote to to Baha'is in Walla Walla in the teens, uh, in the, you know, 19, whatever, 15, 12, 15, eight. Yeah. And uh, so it was special to realize later in life that the this little town that I was born in had such a, a special relationship with, uh, with Abdul Baha. Fantastic. And um, what was it like growing up as a Baha'i? Did you ever struggle with your beliefs or you were just devout and, and steadfast throughout your whole journey and through youth and adolescence and through college. You went from Gig Harbor High School in Gig Harbor, Washington, right? To, yes. To Stanford and then to Princeton. Yeah. That's quite a journey. Yes. I, f I had a very blessed childhood, a very active Baha'i community, especially when I was a junior youth, Portland, Oregon, there's a very active Baha'i community there. There's a workshop, a dance workshop. We would go on tree planting projects over the over the weekends. You know, there's just several dozen youth that, that you would see on a on a regular basis, and that was, I think, a really important part of um, the development of my Baha'i identity growing up. Um, and so it was kind of a, a wonderful cocoon that that I that I grew up in. Never really challenged, never seriously challenged uh, in in my beliefs until. Uh, as with many people until freshman year of college. And then suddenly, you know, everything is now up, up for, for questioning. And that was an incredible time as well, learning, uh, studying physics and philosophy there, having the fundamentals, you know, the, the very fundamentals uh, questioned, you know, what, you know, does God exist? Is the soul immortal? Why should there be morality? Why should there be morality? You know, why should there be a connection between how the world works and, and, uh, and how we should live in it. Um, but those are the same questions that philosophers have been asking for, for thousands of years. Um, and, you know, that, that connection between how the world works, you know, and, um, and where it's all headed 
and on the basis of those two questions, how we should live our lives and how we should you know, live our lives both collectively uh, and individually. All of those questions asked, answered, asked and answered again in, in various ways by philosophers throughout the millennia and also by, by different religions. And so fascinating to try to study deeply the, the different answers that have been given uh, and to try to find the threads that bind them together. Is there a coherent story behind it all? Mm-hmm. Is there a coherent story behind, on the one hand, just the, uh, the very logical, uh, mathematical thinking that science brings to our understanding of the world, realizing that everything is written in, everything that we can see and measure is written in the language of mathematics. How do you correlate that with spiritual experiences, with the collective spiritual experience of, of the human race and how it's been expressed in art, in music, and, and in religion? How do these all fit together? You know, do they not fit together? It's kind of the modern fashion to, to argue that the two are completely separate, uh, that religion will, has to go its own way and science will go, go its way. So you were wrestling with these things at a very young age, philosophically and spiritually and kind of personally, because these are the debates that also happen in the dorm room. Absolutely. Yeah. So what was that like going from this idyllic Baha'i background and all of a sudden you're in Stanford University and you're 18 years old and a lot of things come into conflict? That's right. On the one hand, you have a very supportive Baha'i community there a wonderful Baha'i club, absolutely amazing individuals. At the same time, your day-to-day interactions with people in your dorm, with people in your classrooms. For me, you know, uh, for, for the first time, having the, the deepest beliefs challenged. Does God exist? Do we have souls? You know, is, is there a point? Why should we have morality? Why should we have morality? You know, why should we live in a particular way. Does anyone have the authority to tell us what to do? You mm-hmm. know, once, once you take away the idea that there is a God who is watching you, perhaps who's judging you, who's rewarding or punishing you on the basis of your actions, for most that takes away the, the driving motivation behind acting in a good way. I, there are always those who will act in a moral way in the absence of any framework of reward and punishment. Um, but Abdul Baha said that those people are as scarce as the philosopher's stone. Oh, he wow. Says, you know, some may imagine secret of divine civilization. So some may imagine that it would be possible. It's for, interesting because I, I've met people like that without any external morality or background in, in faith or even a really screwed up family, but they'll just make the right choices and they just go, it just feels right. And I'm just, it's, I'm just going to be doing the right thing. And they, mm-hmm. they have an internal moral compass, but you are, mm-hmm. you're right that it, it, it's pretty rare. It's a small minority. Yeah. It's, it seems as though there's a, there's a need it quite, quite apart from the truth of it, which is an interesting and, and kind of dangerous point to make apart from the truth of does God exist? Are there consequences for our actions? Uh, following on the existence of God. There's this, this, the separate but related question of, you know, how should we act in the world? To what extent has belief in God and the threat of punishment or the promise of, of reward been used uh, to motivate right behavior? Mm. Um, and what if that behavior is right? What if the wrong ideas motivate the right behavior? Mm. Mm. That's kind of a, a, yeah. a question that one could ask. Is In other words, for thousands of years, the Greek, Greek philosophers have, have connected the idea of the good and the beautiful and the true. The assumption being, if, if you have one, you have the other. Um, is it true that what is good and what is true are always correlated? You know, is it possible sometimes that what's good for society may be that people believe in something which is not capital T true, but it's in some way maybe an approximation of the truth? What's an example? Well, one of the principal teachings of the Baha'i faith is the relativity of religious truth. The idea that over the centuries, over the millennia, what we, what we have taken to be the, you know, the divine fundamentals uh, or the laws of religion, social laws have changed. Well, why would they change? Is it that truth changes? 
that you know capital T truth changes, or is it that we actually never have access to that capital T truth, but that we only have access to various approximations of it, uh, and that those approximations help guide human behavior in in some global sense to move in the right direction, whatever the right direction means, but that to imagine that in any given snapshot in time, we're in possession of the truth is in, in fact one of the problems of religion today. Uh, right. Because you have these different warring uh, groups, some actually outright at war, others only at war in their minds. But it's been uh, a, each it's been, convinced that they have the truth. And it's been a challenge every time there's been a new messenger because he abnegates. Right. Is that the right word? Ab- yes. Uh, every, yeah. Some of the abrogates so, abrogate so much of some what of the, came, some what of the came teaching. before. Yeah. And it might seem that, well, hold on, is he changing the truth on us? Yeah. Or is it that in every in every case, what they're doing is in view of promoting the good. They're not promoting, I, I, I'm going out on a limb here. They're not delivering the absolute truth to us. And, and, I, and I think that's a safe statement to say, uh-huh. because even Baha'u'llah says he doesn't have access to the truth. You know, the, the claim is that he has more access to the truth than we do. And he tells it to us in a language we can understand. Hmm. With the purpose of helping to drive humanity collectively forward so that it can better access the truth. But there are no, there are no hard lines. There are no black and whites. It's shades of gray. In, in one of his tablets, Baha'u'llah said, upon no thing hath it been written, this is forbidden or this is permissible. But rather everything is as it is according to the exigencies of the day. Mm. And this statement, which is a fundamental statement of the relativity of religious truth. Well, couldn't, couldn't is, you use think, that? A, but doesn't, an that earthquake. Con- doesn't that contradict a lot of the statements about the, you know, some of the law, obeying the laws of the, of the messengers and the laws of the, of the Akdas in that, you know, couldn't you use that to bend it like, well, I'm just going to drink a little bit because it's a, it's part of my wine tasting book group <laughs> and I'm following the exigencies of the day. Well, in relation to a particular day, there are certain exigencies which hold. We just have had this sort of conversation in, in relation to the big picture, in relation to sort of the whole planet, you know, across all ages. But in a particular day and age, there's, there's something that's needed. You know, there, there's a particular way of life which better promotes the further expansion of consciousness, which is the ultimate goal of religion and science and, and what ultimately unites religion and science. Okay. Is. Before we get there, and sorry to jump on you here a little bit, because I want to... We're, keep getting, we're getting away from the personal thing. What's it like for you, your 18, 19-year-old <laughs> philosophy student, both your personal life and in your philosophical life, bumping up against these very different ideas? Well, uh, personal experiences, I mean, what just ran the gamut. I mean, in, in undergraduate, my, my first undergraduate roommate was actually a, a fundamentalist Christian who tried very hard during the course of the year to to make a conversion, shared with me uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Mm-hmm. We read that and discussed it at length. Other friends down the hall were, were already uh, hardened, convinced atheists. Uh, there is no meaning. There's just whatever, whatever you make of it. And so for the first time, I was, I was really called upon to, to try to justify what it is that I believed. And one of the hardest things being born into the, into the Baha'i faith is that moment of realization where you suddenly realize that, hold on, I'm a Baha'i because my parents were Baha'is, which puts me fundamentally in the same position as everyone else who's born into this or that religion mm-hmm. and doesn't question it. Mm-hmm. You know? So at what point do you question it? And in what manner do you question it? Mm. Uh, because you have to question it at yeah. some point. Mm-hmm. This is part of the, the, the spiritual responsibility of every individual, no matter, no matter under what circumstances you're born. Um, other, and if you don't, then you're no different than everybody else who, who's born into this or that religious faith and just accepts it because that's the comfortable thing to do. Mm-hmm. Because, well, all your friends are this or your parents are this. And there's a, huge inertia involved. So how did you question it? 
for me, fortunately, it was um, a, a nonviolent process uh, of gradually the, the the many sacred cows that existed in my head were were slain, you know, one by one in a way that transitioned, I think, to what I would like to think is a, is is a a more rounded, more subtle. Uh, deeper way of of of, of understand multifaceted way of understanding things, rather than the whole thing breaking down, it was more a realization that faith is is a very multifaceted thing. It's like a sphere. Someone wrote to Shoghi Effendi once and said there are all these contradictions in the Baha'i writings, outright contradictions. It says this here and it says that there. Uh, and and Shoghi Effendi wrote back or on, on his behalf. A, a letter came back saying, "You should regard the Baha'i writings, the Baha'i teachings, like a sphere. There there are points, poles apart, and in between are the thoughts and doctrines that unite them." And I think that's a really profound principle. In light of that principle, one can understand how there can be what, on the face of it, seem to be incompatible frameworks for understanding reality. And these apparently incompatible frameworks can nevertheless be part of a single coherent picture. Mm. For example, the whole, I'll call it theistic narrative. There is a God who loves and cares for creation, created at some point in time, loves and cares for it, loves and cares for us individually, sends prophets for our guidance at periodic intervals when needed, answers prayers, performs miracles occasionally. Um, the whole narrative that we're familiar with mm-hmm. from a Judeo-Christian Islamic perspective might seem to be entirely incompatible with a more Eastern narrative. Let's call it Buddhist or, or Taoist, which doesn't even have the idea of a supreme being in the sense that there is a being that exists, but nevertheless has a sense of the spirit and a sense of human spirituality and morality, which is so much in line and, uh, and, and so beautifully consonant, uh, with the morality of, uh, the core morality of of, of religion in the West. I find it interesting that, Western society picks and chooses what of Buddhism it likes and what works for it because so much of the Buddha's writings are about, you know, the, what is it? The eightfold path and the four noble truths. And Mm -hmm. if there's morality at the center of so much of his, of his teachings and Mm -hmm. so much of the faith, but, Mm -hmm. but, you know, whether it's Eckhart Tolle or whether it's Mm -hmm. your local Mm -hmm. yoga teacher, they kind of say, Oh, it's just breathe in the moment. That's Buddhism. Yeah. And uh, acceptance and letting your thoughts go, and that's and that's a vital part of uh, yes. of Buddhist tradition as well. But there's this whole other aspect. Yes, there. how do you separate what's true and essential from what may be man-made? Is one of the great challenges. But we know that there that there has to be something uniting them. Baha'u'llah says regarding his own revelation, "This is the tree which is neither of the east nor of the west," and he was quoting the Quran when he said that, but. He says that in relation to, to his own revelation. There's something to be drawn from both traditions. And, and what is that one thing? If you were to say, well, what is it? If it's not God or the monotheistic God of the Old and the New Testament of, of the Quran, if even that is an approximation. I mean, Abdu'l Bahan's answer question says the divine reality is sanctified from singleness. How much more above plurality? So even this idea that there's one God is an approximation. Uh, maybe it's a better approximation to polytheism or atheism, but nevertheless, it, it's an approximation. I sort of lost the thread, but no, that's that's fantastic. So, um, what's what's the next part of your journey? Why did you you chose physics over philosophy? I chose physics over. Well, I chose physics and philosophy as an undergraduate. Um, I thought it, it would be the greatest thing to study both. That they both dealt with the biggest questions. Uh, although from different angles, one from a more mathematical angle and the other from more of a pure, pur- purely logical angle. Um, I was so inspired by some of the, the lectures I heard as a freshman 
um, in, in my freshman dorm. And I, and I have absolutely no regrets of picking those two. But you didn't go to graduate school in philosophy. You went I did physics. not. No, I ended up going to graduate school in physics. And I think that really followed the initial spark of inspiration I had back when I was seven, watching Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Oh, fantastic. Did you see that, that when it came out? was a huge inspiration to me, too. Huge inspiration to me. Almost a religious inspiration. I mean, it was... But the he tone had said, that he struck was, he was a very spiritual spir- tone. It was a spiritual tone. Yeah. That's that's where I think they kind of missed the boat with Neil deGrasse Tyson in the in the part two, yeah. which was all about the miracles of science. Little pokes and jabs here, yeah, and pokes there, and jabs that weren't there. But with, but Carl uh, Sagan had that sense yeah. of wonder. You mm-hmm. talk about the Greek philosophers mm-hmm. and starting with that place of wonder, and it's wonder and awe that leads to curiosity. Yes. that begins us on our. Yes. I, a journey of ideas. And Carl Sagan had that in spades. And it was just, isn't this miraculous? How can we possibly all understand this? And and black holes and infinity and gravity and and the Egyptians and the history of thought and ideas was 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 mesmerizing. In the opening paragraph. It's like, you know what? It's yeah. like the original Star Wars. Those first two oh, Star yeah. Wars movies. Oh, just yeah. It's like a revelation. Yeah. With mysticism. They're filled with mysticism. They didn't even realize it at the mm-hmm. time and uh, mm-hmm. they weren't quite ever able to capture that again yeah that's true it, just in the opening sentences of, of Carl Sagan's cosmos he strikes this just amazing note of the grandeur and wonder of the cosmos and he concludes with I think a statement which I mean could be out of any religion he says we are a way for the cosmos to know itself wow and I think that kind of sums it up. I mean, it sums it up on, on, on the science angle and it sums it up on the angle of religion as well. I mean, just a few Isn't years that from ago. from the Quran himself? That's yes. kind of an opposite. Yes. It's and like so a, the yang. Somehow, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's one of these principles of, 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 of the mystics in all traditions that there is a, a correlation between the macrocosm and the microcosm, between the, the universe and the, and, the, and the human reality, that the two somehow recapitulate each other. Uh, Rumi said, and Baha'u'llah quotes Rumi in the Seven Valleys, uh, dost thou consider thyself a puny form when within thee the universe is folded? Mm-hmm. Just a few years ago, the, the Universal House of Justice, in writing about this phenomenon of religion, the unity of religion, says um, in a very challenging but I think uh, absolutely profound statement that, that Baha'u'llah did not come to bring one more religion to stand alongside the existing multiplicity of sectarian organizations. Rather, he has recast the very conception of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. And that brings us right back to Carl Sagan's statement in, in the cosmos that they use the word consciousness. Kind of the, yes. The principal that's amazing. force impelling the development of consciousness and what impels that's not consciousness even, forward. That's not even civilization. It's consciousness goes beyond civilization. It, it goes beyond civilization. I mean, you can be a highly civilized society but be devoid of spirit so civilization is almost the that's the secondary thing the primary thing is consciousness and how is consciousness built up it's built up by matter matter is a substrate of consciousness but not just any matter not just a cloud of hydrogen gas and you know it has to have coalesced into something something more complex and those more complex configurations act as a um as a substrate for higher and higher expressions of what the Baha'i writings call spiritual powers, the first of these being just the power of unity, just the power of atoms coming together in the hearts of stars. When Baha'u'llah says, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illumine the whole earth. It's actually literally the power of unity of the hydrogen atoms coming together, forming helium atoms that produces the light that that illuminates the earth. At higher and higher levels, those unities, uh, first of all, in the molecular realm, and then at lower levels of life, and then higher levels of life, we find that the more things become complex, the more things become arranged in larger and larger and more coherent configurations, the more powers and capacities become manifested. You know, at the level of the human being, it's only through the complexity of our brains that the mind can become revealed. Mm. And likewise, it's only when people come together in coherent configurations, which we call societies or civilizations, that even higher expressions of the spirit become manifest, higher expressions of consciousness, otherwise known as evolution. This whole process 
is so seamlessly um, a part of the physical evolution that scientists since the time of Darwin have been investigating. We think of evolution, or, or many people think of evolution as a threat to religious belief. Uh, f- from a Baha'i perspective, it is entirely consistent with the whole picture of things. Physical things are evolving, uh, but they're not evolving randomly. Evolution is in the direction of higher degrees of consciousness, not necessarily as a straight line. I mean, just look at the dinosaurs. So a couple hundred million years ago, there was a great event, you know, or 65 million years ago, right? you know, at periodic, at periodic it's, times. It, it's in the, circular. It's circular or cyclical and circular in, in a kind of a scary way. Abdu'l Baha in the Promulgation of Universal Peace in one of the talks he gave in the United States says that there are universal cycles and that there have been many universal cycles preceding this one. And at the end of each universal cycle, all trace of the previous cycle is erased. Goodness. So what does that say about human life? We think of human life and human civilization as, as linear. Right. We're used to thinking of progress. There's protozoa and then little lizards. And, then and it all sort of is supposed to keep going. Coming right? up and but leading if, to us here. If it's, a, if it's a cycle in the end, if everything, if there's a, a great crashing and bursting of the elements and then, uh, and then everything is reborn, the question then rises, well, then what's the purpose of human life? We, we would like to think that we're contributing to an ever advancing civilization. This is our purpose. It's all along very, very much along the narrative of progress, which for the last few centuries since the scientific revolution has been one of the guiding narratives of the Western world that our children are going to have a better life than we do because science continues to advance and our mm. knowledge of the universe continues mm-hmm. to advance. So at a local level or at a sort of at the level of decades, years, even, even centuries, we, we can think of time as linear, but on these larger scales, right. it's actually cyclical. We know this just from, from cosmology. We know that the and from planetary science, we know the sun has a limited amount of nuclear fuel. At some point, it's going to run out of nuclear fuel. The mm-hmm. Earth is going to be burned to a crisp and then frozen. Uh, it's it, There is a time, uh, there, you know, the hourglass has been tipped and the we've sand is running a, through it. We've still got a billion years. We've got years. plenty of times. I, yeah. Time. We're not, we're not talking about <laughs> any time in the near future. But as long as we're talking about sort of the grand philosophical implications... Things are cyclical at the at the yeah. at the largest but level, and that has that, implications. Speaking of that linear growth, you know, it's so interesting to me that contemporary culture views it as a you know, a, a necessity that science, and just a, a natural part of life, that science is going to progress and provide a better future for us. But it doesn't believe that spirituality can progress and provide a better future for us. What's the difference? We we we, we like to draw this artificial distinction between the physical and the spiritual. Mm. And maybe it's a useful distinction. Maybe it, you know, because it helps morality is much more crisply defined if you believe in spirits and bodies, because it lines up nicely with your idea of good actions and evil actions. But is it really the case when you really get down to the reality of things? Are spirit and matter really two different kinds of stuff? Mm. Here again, Abdu'l-Bahá gives us a different way of looking at it. He says, in one sentence, he explodes all of our ideas of Cartesian dualism. He says, to the, to the vegetable, he says, the animal is the spiritual reality. So if that's the way we look at it, then spirit and matter are not two different kinds of stuff, but rather two different ways of viewing the universe, two different directions of looking at the universe. Spirit is another way of saying we're looking in the direction of higher degrees of consciousness and matter is what we call uh, what we call it when we're looking behind us. So there's, there's something in front of us and there's something behind us. Abdul Baha draws this all out in the form of a circle. One of the last chapters of some answer questions, he said, this is one of the deepest principles of divine philosophy. He says that the universe is like a circle it's comprised of two arcs. There's an arc of descent and the, uh, there's an arc of ascent. It's sort of like the snake swallowing its own tail, the, mm-hmm. the, the Ouroboros, the sign of the alchemist. You know, that this idea has been in the world for you know, millennia that everything can be described sort of writ large uh, as a circle. You have things uh, emanating from the one and returning to the one. We can sort of splice this into uh, Carl Sagan's statement about consciousness and saying that as you traverse the degrees of the circle, consciousness expands. And so as we 
become more and more aware of ourselves and of the universe, we're traversing this circle. Uh, and whatever's in front of us along this arc of ascent mm. is what we call spirit. And whatever is behind us is what we call matter. And the important thing about that is the more we know about the universe, that dividing line between spirit and matter changes. It's not a solid line. It's a, it's a dotted line. And it changes according to our understanding of things. Just a couple thousand years ago, lightning and thunder were spiritual things. Right. They were the direct actions of the gods in the world. Punishment for this and that. They're expressing their anger. And that was the most rational way we had at the time for explaining these events. Mm-hmm. As we came to understand the physical world more and more, we realized that what we thought were spiritual events or actions of the gods had natural explanations for it, ultimately derived in mathematical laws. Today, we're dealing with things like, well, consciousness itself. How do we explain the operations of the human mind? How do we explain how we think? Right now, you could make an argument that, oh, it's a spiritual thing. It has no connection to the physical world. Mm. Who's to say that in the decades and years to come, science may not crack the code, explain the workings of the human brain in a way that might put traditional religious perspectives a bit on the defensive. I think that's quite possible. I think they but already are. They are. Yeah. But I, yeah, I think that's the next that's the next frontier is where is consciousness and where's the separation? Are you pouring some more tea? Ah, delicious. <laughs> Where is consciousness and what's the separation between the brain and the mind? These are some, yes. some big questions that are both spiritual and kind of neurological. Yes. Uh, interesting questions. For instance, if you could neurologically or chemically reproduce states of consciousness, which seem to be similar to those experienced by, say, people in deep states of meditation, the question arises, well, is this a cheap way of getting spiritual? Is this a shortcut to spirituality? Um, or is the experience that people have? Right, you mean if you put a needle into your brain and inject a chemical and right. give you a, a... Various ways of doing that. Uh, Didn't uh, they find a place in the brain where spiritual ecstasy kind of exists and belief of God even exists? That's and, right. And as a spot in the brain? Yes. And could they you, stimulate you probe that, that, with that Yeah, with an electrode? And people have spiritual experiences. Well, yeah. what does that say? Does that say that, does that say that, okay, it's all... None of it's real then, you know, is the conclusion that, oh, therefore there's no spirit. Well, look at the drug ayahuasca, which all these yeah. youth are going down to the Amazon and taking ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And all these kind of secular atheists are having these incredible mystical experiences that mm -hmm. are blowing their minds. I've spoken to several guys who have undergone a profound kind of mm -hmm. religious transformation from doing essentially peyote or mescaline, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I guess it was the same thing back with Timothy Leary in the late sixties. Not anything I'm advocating here, but it is that. Uh, yeah. Who's to say that they're wrong for who's having come out the other side with uh, a sense of the larger picture of the connectedness of things. Sam Harris has written a book called waking up where he describes, you know, these sorts of experiences he had uh, when he was younger and also, describes, you know, meditative practices for the atheistically minded. Oh, nice. And that sort of thing, I think, is uh, we're going to be seeing more and more of this. People who are not traditionally religiously minded, but nevertheless have an awareness and understanding of the deeper potentialities of the, of the human mind. Who's to say what's spiritual and what's not? Well, I've, I had a conversation with Elon Musk for Soul Pancake, who's an atheist, but an atheist agnostic. And he's come out recently saying something that is becoming increasingly more popular in the atheist set, that we are probably in an avatar right now. So we are probably a video game avatar in a three-dimensional construct, and that when our bodies pass away, we'll have a vision of who's playing us on the other side. And that's really not any different than the Baha'i writings on life after death. Right. What's the difference between saying we're in a simulation created by a computer programmer and saying we're in a world created by God? Ontologically, these are nearly identical statements. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it's nearly identical with what Plato said 2,500 years ago yeah, in his Republic. In the cave. The cave. So you have the shadows on the wall. Well, they're pixelated, you know? Right. That, what's the difference? Instead of shadows, it's, they're, yeah. Instead they're, of shadows, those are the, those they're, are the they're simulations. Ones and zeros. So who's to say that's not that's not that's not reality. Uh, so you go to study physics. What kind of physics are you studying? 
I'm studying, well, under the, the inspiration of the ghost of Carl Sagan, I'm, I'm studying cosmology and astrophysics uh, with one of the architects of the, of the modern, of the Big Bang Theory at, at Princeton. Um, Who's that? Jim Peebles. An amazing individual, absolutely brilliant. Some of those humbling experiences just, you know, sitting in the office with him as he's working on the board, you know, his mind going in directions I couldn't, you know, I can follow where he's going, but I couldn't go there myself. Yeah. You know, kind of like in movies where he's doing the equations and then with the X's it's and like, R's. How do you know where to go next? You know, okay, I can understand the path that you've taken, but at, if when you're at a particular point, how do you know whether to go this way or that way? And there's a certain kind of, of genius that certain people have, and that's what makes them, you know, the very best at what so they So you're do. saying there's almost an improvisational quality, almost yeah. as if he's following his impulses, doing a saxophone solo like John Coltrane, yeah. moving things forward, but he's doing it with equations oh, on a blackboard. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of intuition involved, I think, doing physics at the highest levels. Mm. Uh, it's definitely part, part intuitive, or if not, you know, the, the great discoveries are, are, are very intuitive. Uh, in their nature. And then, you know, they're, of course, justified and expressed through the language of, of mathematics. But then you go to the World Center after that. Yes, that was the most difficult decision uh, of my life, probably, was having finished a PhD in physics at a great institution with a great advisor, having an opportunity to go on the traditional route, get a postdoc, become a, a, a professor, teach physics, it's a great life. It's an amazing community of people. It's like incredibly intellectually, stimu intellectually stimulating. At the same time, there are a hundred people competing for every position. If, if I don't take that position, there are going to be 99 other people just as qualified who can do it. At the World Center, there are not as many people there and, and a huge need. And, and what's being done there also of great consequence. And so when the invitation came to go to the World Center um, and serve in the research department, I had to choose between my original love of physics and, and, and astronomy and what I felt would be in the balance, the best way of using my time in a way that would make the greatest difference. Wow. That was uh, quite a spiritual quandary, I can imagine. How did you go through that decision-making process? I got so lucky um, because it turns out that one of the colleagues of my dissertation advisor was working in Haifa uh, at the university there at the Technion. And so I was able to, uh, to go to Haifa with a, a part-time position at the university and continue my research in cosmology, go to conferences. And what is cosmology exactly? A lot of people say, oh, cosmetology. Uh, you study cosmetology. And I was going to say your makeup well, is, is very well done. I'd say the cosmology is the study of the makeup of the universe. Uh, cosmetology is the study of the universe of makeup. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's the study of the, the, the universe at the largest scales. Uh, sometimes it's dealing with the initial moments, the Big Bang and, and its after effects. Sometimes it's as, as with what I was studying, it's the sort of less exciting aspect of characterizing the universe as it is now, you know, the, the galaxies, how they're clustered, um, what that tells you about what the mass of the universe is. One of the great holy grails of, uh, of science, certainly of cosmology, is uh, understanding the nature of the dark matter that seems to was there dark space. matter? Did dark matter exist when you were in grad school? It, it seems oh, like yes, a very recent discovery. It did. Dark it's matter like, had been when around I grew for up. Decades. They said, "Hey, there's here's the stuff, you know." And between there's blank space. There's stuff and there's blank space, and gravity sometimes holds it together. And then now they're saying, "Like, yeah. wait a minute, no, no, no. The stuff is only like one eighth of the universe, and dark right. matter and dark energy are." Uh, it's yeah, it's two parts. So there's dark matter, dark energy. And I was I happened to be at Princeton in a really exciting time when dark energy just became discovered. So I came to Princeton in 95 and graduated in 2000. It was right in the middle of that that the results were first announced. Uh, Perlmutter and others, uh, which won the Nobel Prize, that discovered uh, dark energy just on the basis of a few very distant supernovae that were a little bit fainter than they should have been. Uh, 
and on that basis uh, came to the conclusion that the universe was accelerating a little bit faster than we thought it ought to be. And the only explanation uh, that we have within the current framework of our understanding is that there must be a component of the universe greater, of course, than all the matter that we see by many orders of magnitude and greater even than the dark matter, which even that is invisible, but at least we have some sense of where it is because it directly feeds into how galaxies move. And so we can see it indirectly, but this dark energy is very difficult to see. You can only see it at the largest scale. So I imagine you've got some expert Baha'i analogy for both dark matter and dark energy being these forces at work on the physical universe that are almost indetectable, but are there through certain experiments. So hit me, oh, yeah. hit me oh, with the spiritual that. analogy of those, boom, <laughs> lay it on us. <laughs> well, Bahala says in, in the Tablet of Wisdom that the universe came into being through the interaction between the active force and that which is its recipient. What he meant by that is anyone's guess. One possible guess uh, is that we're talking about matter and energy. Uh, because he, he says, Bahala goes on to say that these two are the same, yet they are different. E equals MC squared, you know, matter and energy, you know, the active force and its recipient, the same yet different. However, I, at, at the same time, am reluctant and feel that it's dangerous to take any statements from the Baha'i writings, even, even the same that I just quoted, and try to extract from it any kind of uh, scientific conclusions. It's a dangerous business. I mean, people have tried and failed in the past, and we see the results in you know, the intelligent design movement. Abdu'l-Bahá says, weigh everything presented to you as religion in the balance of science and reason. If it passes the test, accept it for it is the truth, and if it fails, reject it for it is superstition. So you go to an agnostic, and you present to them the fact that there is an almighty yet unknowable God, and they say... Okay. Well, is that a fact? Well, it's in the Baha'i writings. I mean, in about a thousand different times, uh, is said in various different ways. He is God. We'll just go with that. And yes. uh, how to the agnostic, they're like, okay, how does that pass the science test? Show me the laboratory experiment. Show me the blackboard or the computer program or the algorithm that shows me that there is some force beyond the physical because you know, as soon as you've got Copernicus and Darwin, you don't need a God, you know, mm -hmm. there doesn't need to be a God. There is That's just right. stuff and the stuff operates according to these, uh, certain rules. Baha'u'llah also says, of course, the Baha'i writings are, are filled. Every sentence almost makes some reference to God. Baha'u'llah also says God is beyond all names and attributes. Uh, among the attributes of things, Abdu'l Baha says in one of his tablets on the opinions of the Sufis, among the attributes of things are existence. To exist is an attribute, whether something exists or not. To be one or many is an attribute of things. We're used to thinking of God as necessarily existent, as singular, the creator. And we say, okay, God is unknowable, but we know God exists. Uh, we know that there's only one. Even those statements, however, are relative. They're relative to the ultimate reality, which we have no access to. Um, to say that God exists is, in a certain sense, an incoherent statement for the reason that the divine reality is beyond even the attribute of existence. And this makes it very, it sort, can't it sort of throws you for a bit of a loop. We can't well, picture anything beyond existence and non-existence. Right. We can't imagine it. And so all we have to imagine, that, and this is what Baha'u'llah says, all you've got is me. He says, all you've got is a manifestation. You know, Abdu'l Baha writes at the top of all of his tablets, he is God. And someone asks Abdu'l Baha, what do you mean by that? You know, it just sounds like a tautology of God is God. You know? And, and Abdu'l Baha says, says what, what he means by that is by he, he means the manifestation. Everything we know about the divine reality has a tangible reference point, and that tangible reference point is the prophet. Uh, that divine reality itself is beyond even being addressed as an object. There's a tablet by the Bab which really throws you for a loop, and it's published in Nader Saidi's Gate of the Heart. It says, the worshiper, if he worships God as the object of his worship, then he has joined partners with God and has never worshipped God. But 
Whoa. Whoa. I mean, that's the way every prayer Freaky. is written. Right? Yeah. Every prayer is written as we're the subject, worshiping God as object. And the Bob turns around and says, well, you're an idolater if you, if you do that. Well, he, he can't mean that, right? Or if he means it, in what way does he mean it? It forces us, I think, it forces us to realize that there is more than one framework. We're back to the sphere and the two sides of the sphere mm-hmm. and the, do- the thoughts and ideas that unite them. There is an idea of the monotheistic God that exists, whose existence is proven, that we address in prayer, that is a tangible source of human ethical conduct. It's an approximation. There's another idea that, you know, more, more in line with the religions of the East, that, you know, that God doesn't exist the way other things exist, that there even is no being to, one, to which one can properly address oneself. That's another way of thinking about the divine, which is basically that you can't think about it. The moment you think about it, you're already committing some grave, you know, some, some grave error. Both of these perspectives have to coexist. And how do they coexist? How does it work in science? We have different ways of understanding the physical universe. We have, take gravity. There's, a, there's Newton, who a few hundred years ago, gives us the equation, a very simple equation for gravity, GMM over R squared. You can get a lot out of that. You can send rocket ships to the moon. Uh, but a couple hundred years ago, Einstein comes along with a different theory of gravity of which Newton's theory is a subset, is a, is a limiting case. Okay. But in Einstein's theory of gravity, space and time are not, are not absolute. It's a completely different metaphysics, even though th- 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 these two theories get you, in, in terms of the world around us, get you almost identical results, but they're based upon completely different metaphysical assumptions. Richard Feynman makes this point in the opening pages of his famous set of Feynman uh, of lectures that he gave at Caltech where he makes this point about physics, which is, I think, one of, one of the most profound points I've seen philosophically, is that in physics, you can be off by just a fraction of a percent in the result, but it changes completely the theory behind it. And it, I think it's that, that, that same sort of idea applies here. There are different ideas of the divine, all of which are approximations, some of which are more practical, useful approximations, others of which seem less practical, some of them may be closer to the ultimate reality of, realities of things, but all of them have a part to play. Just like practically speaking, if you want to measure the, the, the motion of a pendulum, you would use Newton's laws um, to, to plug in gravity. You wouldn't use Einstein's laws because they're just too difficult to work with. Even though you know, in theory, Einstein's laws are a better representation of reality and that they actually, because they don't put space and time on an absolute framework that they're they're closer to the to the realities of things could it be the same thing with god that we think of god in these absolute terms god exists god doesn't exist maybe there are other ways of thinking about it and these ways are found in the baha'i writings they're not the majority of the baha'i writings but they don't have to be you know the majority of the baha'i writings are written for a particular purpose and this is exactly what baha'u'llah says he says it's the exigencies of the day everything he's telling us is in relationship to moving humanity to a particular place it needs to go. And to get humanity to move to that particular place, there are certain, there's a certain, certain things need to be said, certain things need to be done, certain motivating factors. To move the ball down the field. To move the ball down the field. Right. And, you go and to I field, always you know, like to think about, just ponder about, like, let's cut to a thousand years from now and there's another manifestation. Mm-hmm. What is that revelation yeah. like? Because it could be, with coming on the heels of the golden age of humanity, the mind reels of what that might be. There is something very interesting about that in the tablet that Baha'u'llah revealed, not translated into English, but to just paraphrase it. He says, in the next revelation, he says, will not be revealed in verses. Oh. He says, because at that time, everyone will be speaking verses. And so the proof, he's not saying it won't be revealed in verses, but he says that verses will not be the proof of the next uh, of the next manifestation he says we will ordain another proof doesn't say what it is oh that's wow as much as he says. that's fantastic so what's fascinating to me too about uh your many different qualities and i i want to say for the listeners too that we're going to a fundraising event tonight for the mona foundation and stephen is not the physicist 
He's not the translator. Uh, he's not the philosopher. He's the piano player. You play the piano? Yeah, I, I play piano. I, I'd like to say to say that in the past tense, but I will be playing tonight. Okay, fantastic. A great <laughs> skill. But one of your other skills is uh, just absolutely mind-blowing to me. I barely have mastery of English, but you have learned Farsi and Arabic and Hebrew and uh, worked as a translator for over 10 years at the World Center. So you transitioned out of physics into translations and work with the holy texts. How did that start? Uh, it started my last year at Stanford. A friend of mine was taking care of Marzia Gale, who was one of the translators of the Seven Valleys, of parts of Selections and of Abdu'l-Bahá, of Secret of Divine Civilization, um, she was the daughter of Ali Kuli Khan, who famously learned Arabic when Abdu'l-Bahá asked him to, to translate a tablet from Arabic, and Ali Kuli Khan said, but, but Master, I don't, I don't know Arabic. And Abdu'l-Bahá smiled and patted him on the back and handed him some rock candy and said, you go translate the tablet. And, uh, and, he, and from that point forward, he says, he learned, uh, he didn't say exactly how, but he ended up translating Arabic. Uh, and it, it, the rock candy gets partly credited for that. So Ali Kuli Khan's daughter, Marzia Gale, was one of the great inspired translators of the Baha'i writings. And she was fully bilingual, uh, which I'm not. And she had uh, an amazing literary sense, also has written many, many articles on the Baha'i faith and published uh, a couple of books. While I was there at, uh, at Stanford my last year, I would have dinner with her every, every Wednesday and she would give us a little impromptu Persian lesson, teaching us some hidden words, little bits of grammar, tell us about the guardian. Would you like to hear my Persian? Time. Love to hear it. Okay, here we go. Fesinjun, Gorma Sabze, Tadik. Tadik, oh, that I know too. And Hodafes. Uh, <laughs> Very good. That's it. And Merci. Which I think is hysterical that they don't even have a word for thank you. <laughs> they got to steal it from steal another it from language. Steal it from French. Yes. So I that that was my story. So Marzia point. Gale. She, Marzia she Gale. launched you on a journey she launched me on the journey learning Farsi. Yes, but it wasn't until I got to the World Center, uh, in between my undergraduate and graduate study, I was there for a couple of years as a youth volunteer. I was encouraged to and inspired to begin the study of Arabic and Persian in earnest. Uh, by Mr. Dunbar, because uh, I became really aware while I was there for the first time, e even having grown up as a Baha'i, wasn't really aware just how much is out there that has not yet been translated uh, and how much of what is out there of what Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha, the Bab have written. So what are some numbers around that? What we have in translation is about 5%. Holy moly. Um, less, depending on how you count it. I mean, if you count all the Persian letters of Shoghi Effendi, uh, we have just a couple percent maybe of the writings of the Bab translated. Uh, it's not widely known, but the Bab revealed around, if, if Baha'u'llah revealed around 6 million words, the Bab revealed around 5 million. So the sizes of their revelations are roughly comparable, even though Baha'u'llah's ministry was 40 years long and the Bab's was, was only six years long. So there's a massive amount that has yet to be translated. And, and, most of that is just personal correspondence, encouragement, uh, but some of it is on philosophical, mystical themes. And when I was at the World Center the first time, uh, I first realized just the vastness of what was out there, and I had to get at it. You so know, why isn't why isn't more being translated? Why are we not getting access to this stuff? It's purely a human resource uh, issue. The House of Justice. So I, calling I all wants, translators. Absolutely. Get your butts to the World Center. And you might think, well, there's so many Baha'is out there who speak Persian and understand the tablets. You know, it should be a Persian simple matter. And English. But it's just not a simple matter because it's one thing to know what it says and to hammer out a rough translation. It's another thing to cast it into a language which is as far as possible seamless with the language that Shoghi Effendi used. Mm. Abdul Baha actually wrote in a tablet, he said, the translation work must be done by a committee, he says, of Persian-speaking and English-speaking people, uh, both of whom know both languages, who are also well-versed in the arts and sciences, 
Uh, and he says the, the Persian speaker should, um, an Arabic speaker should, should make the initial translation and the English speaker should cast it in the mold of beautiful uh, and fluid expression. So Abdu'l-Baha even outlines the process uh, that needs to take place. And as far as possible, that's the, that's the process that's followed by the World Center today. But there's, uh, there's a great lack of human resources in this area. So people inspired to do it should know, uh, or thinking about doing it, should know that there's a tremendous need, unfulfilled need in the translation work. Uh, and there's so much out there. So what was that like for you? You said you were working with holy texts. So you got to actually like see the original holy texts. Yes, uh, in some cases, handle them and work with them. Although normally, from the translation perspective of the translation work, one deals with already typed, corrected, you know, proofread text, and you're using, you know, a word processor, um, and and that's where m- most of the work takes place at that at that level. But some of the work involves, particularly when it comes to establishing the text, and by establishing the text, I mean there are always, almost always, multiple handwritten transcriptions of a given tablet. Mm. And the initial question that needs to be resolved in undertaking any work of translation or publication is deciding, well, which of these multiple handwritten copies, maybe several of which are in the hands of reliable scribes, Mm -hmm. but which inevitably, because they're handwritten, have slight differences here and there, which one do you pick? Ah. Um, And so there's, there's a whole science behind that of textual criticism of comparing and collating texts of deducing information, which indirectly from clues and hints, that's a whole, that's a whole uh, hour long conversation on how that's done. Yeah, I'm I'm sure. You said you found some pretty incredible uh, writings of the Bob. Yeah. Part part of the work I was doing was in collating and cataloging and indexing the, the writings of the Bob, which as I mentioned, are nearly as vast as Baha'u'llah's in terms of the total word count. In terms of number of items, it's much smaller. If Baha'u'llah revealed about 20,000 items, tablets, most of them being very short uh, letters to individuals, the Bob revealed only about 2,000 hmm. um, or even less than 2,000, which means, of course, that the typical writing of the Bob is much longer than the typical work of Baha'u'llah's. And some he of did, these writings... He didn't cloak it in brevity then. No, it's some of the works go on at great length. And, um, and we have an incredible, incredibly complete record of even more complete even than the revelation of Baha'u'llah when it comes to the original source texts. You know, more of the, let's call it revelation writing of the Bab has been preserved than the revelation writing of Baha'u'llah. That's insane. Uh, how, is, how is that possible? Partly because uh, circumstances surrounding the, uh, the ascension of, of Baha'u'llah, where we read that certain of Baha'u'llah's papers, two satchels containing his papers, oh, yes. were stolen uh, on that. And were never returned. You can put a lot of writings in two satchels. Yeah. And so the, the whereabouts of this original revelation writing, it still may emerge. You know, it still may be in the possession of, uh, of people who are just looking for the right moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, to, to sell it or to you know right. donate to a library, that sort Be of thing. Be up on eBay. Right. It's not out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> so anyway, one of the most amazing ex- experiences I remember of, of working with these writings in the, in the archives was when I had an envelope of the, of the Bob's writings from the Esfahan period. This was the time when he was under house arrest and didn't now, have... When you say an envelope, what do you mean? Uh, like a, you know, an archival envelope. Okay, okay. Uh, containing fragments. Okay. Well, at, at first sight, they were fragments because they're scraps of paper of varying sizes uh, with ragged edges and holes in the center and, you know, looking like they had come out of the back of someone's pocket. Because uh, paper wasn't readily available to Because him? he was under house arrest, paper was not readily available. Like readily toilet available paper? To and... No, it was, it was sturdier <laughs> stuff than that. But but he would and when I first looked at it, I thought, well, this is just wear and tear because the the owner of the tablet lovingly carried it on their person for decades or something. But actually, it was in that condition when the Bob revealed on it because he the, the revelation is written around the ragged parts of the page and around the holes in, in the, the paper. In the paper, so it, it's it's just a physical evidence yeah. of the of he had the to make do with circumstances. What he had. Yeah. yeah of, yes. Uh, but on that one scrap of paper, there may be several tablets, probably never published before, probably never never seen before, all of which awaiting 
the the next generation of of translators and scholars to arise to to bring this material into into the light of day. Fantastic. And what are you working on now? You're back here in Portland, Oregon, and you've you've got a day job, but I've heard some of your talks online and they're fantastic weaving spirituality mm-hmm. and science. Not even weaving, kind of tearing apart the boundaries between spirituality and science. Yes. My project of late has been trying to weave together these three threads, the thread of philosophy, of physics, uh, and of the Baha'i writings. And it's been a process of, as you say, tearing down in in a sense. It's a process of seeing how the Baha'i writings contain within them the seeds for entirely new ways of thinking about fundamental concepts. The Baha'i writings have redefined the the vocabulary even though they're using the same words necessarily because they're written in you know in in a given language that so has a certain when vocabulary a, when a baha'i says god for instance it might what mean a very sense? different thing a different than thing. what a jew says god right or religion or revelation or spirit you know these words are, are the fundamental vocabulary of religious thought each one of these words has been given a different spin and sometimes a completely different definition in the baha'i writings at the same time as the traditional definition can also be found in the Baha'i writings. And so it, it comes back to this question of the relativity of religious truth and the multifacetedness of it. And that you can have, as Baha'u'llah himself said, different sorts of answers for different sorts of inquirers. Mm. Because ultimately that metaphysical layer, we have no direct access to. All we have are different metaphors, different maps to guide us through that un- unknown territory. And among the maps that guide us through is the, is the narrative, the theistic narrative of God sending prophets periodically. Another map to guide us through the spiritual realm is, the, is a non-theistic narrative, such as we find in the, in the Eastern religious traditions. Both of these narratives, both of these maps have been useful in the past, are useful today, actively. People use these maps to navigate the, you know, the, the terra incognita of the, of the mind. The Baha'i writings... I believe, present us with, we could call it a meta-narrative that joins together all the maps, or at least shows that all these different maps have something in common. Mm. And the one thing they have in common, as Baha'u'llah puts it, is they're all united by the law of love. Baha'u'llah says, everything changes. Every religious ordinance throughout the ages changes, except the law of love. He says, which like a fountain is ever replenished uh, and which never ceases flowing. That law of love, of course, is not just the love of one's neighbor, but it's the love expressed from the level of the atoms through the level of civilizations. It's that force of attraction, that binding force that exists in the universe that science describes, as well as that binding force between human hearts that is the motivating uh, power Behind religions. That's so the when eternal I was constant. A Baha'i kid in Baha'i children's class, I uh, had a Baha'i teacher and she brought in a giant magnet with all these iron filings and nails and screws. And she's like, look, this is the force of love. And I was a precocious, mm-hmm. annoying 12 year old. And I was like, no, it's not. It's the force of hate. And you turn the magnet around. And, and I, <laughs> <laughs> threw the screws at her in her eyeballs. No, I, uh, but I was like, it's magnetism. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a scientific, you can't say it's just love. She's like, no, it's love. Baha'u'llah says mm-hmm. love holds the planets together and love is gravity and love is attraction. And yeah. so you're saying she was right. It's easy to make fun of and people make fun of it regularly. Oh, the, you know, but it's true. You know, that she was right. I she was, was right. Oh man, I feel bad now. <laughs> Sorry, whoever you are. Well, there's so much more we could talk about, and we, we really should have part two of this discussion. I hope you'll join us for uh, Baha'i Blogcast part two of Stephen Phelps. What do you think? I'd love to. You on board with that? On board. Uh, thank you so much. And if people want to check out your work, where can they go? And- Just type my name in YouTube. You'll find, you'll find a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of talks there. Okay, great. I know there's one you did at the Santa Monica Baha'i Center that was really terrific. Yes, and there's oh, there's there's a, a series of lectures on SoundCloud 
uh, from a, a course I gave in Akuto, Italy uh, at the beginning of the year. There are about 25 or, or more hours worth of presentation there. If you really want, <laughs> if you, if you really in-depth. want the in-depth treatment. I'm about halfway through them and they're just fantastic. I can't recommend them more highly. Let's give it up for Stephen Phelps. <sighs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. I love you all. So does Stephen. And the laws of love are going to go on forever. So have a loving, wonderful day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rain. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much. And... Good night.